We ready? Everybody? All right, here we go. Well, welcome everyone. I guess uh, everybody else canceled, so you guys had nothing else to do at 11.15, so thank you for coming. Uh, <laughs> so I wanted to quickly introduce myself, introduce Jeremy, who we are, and then we'll get started here uh, as we get going. Um, our topic today is critical elements of a WMS and labor implementation. Uh, I think you'll find, hopefully, we've got some good nuggets for you as we go through this. Uh, my name is Shannon Kaflish. I am the VP of Sales for Open Sky Group. Uh, Jeremy Hudson, my counterpart here, who will be doing most of the heavy lifting as we go through this today. Uh, Jeremy is the Director of Client Services here at Open Sky. So Open Sky is a global consultant firm. Uh, we work with uh, a couple of different uh, organizations in supplying and deploying, implementing, configuring, whatever you want to call it, uh, implementation, execution systems, WMS, labor systems, transportation management. Uh, our focus is really around helping our clients. One of the things we've seen is a big change and shift in the marketplace uh, in delivering solutions at a more rapid pace, delivering that time to value at a much quicker, in a much quicker uh, time frame. So what we're going to talk about today, though, is a little bit about kind of what we do and how we build a team and why that's important when you think about an implementation and your strategy around kind of taking yourself from a, hey, we've got to do something within our warehouse, we've got to do something within our infrastructure to a, we've got to make a decision, we've made the decision to a go live, and how do you get there? So Jeremy, you want to talk a little bit more about that? Yeah. Good morning, everybody. So uh, elephant in the room, right? We're all a bit stressed out right now. A lot of folks, a lot of things on our mind, losing a lot of sleep at night these days, right? Of course, I'm talking about your WMS labor management project. Nothing else in the world. Just that. That's what's stressing us out. And so the plan today is to walk you through this. Uh, Open Sky has done 700 projects of warehouse management, labor management, et cetera. Um, these can be extremely stressful projects. This is normally, normally what folks look like when they get into these types of projects. And so the idea is to simplify that a bit, understand what the largest concerns are right, and what we really should be focusing on from an implementation standpoint, what those projects look like. Whether you're doing a WMS selection right now, whether you're mid-project, whether you're getting ready to embark upon a project, whatever it is in terms of where you're at in this process, right, we want to make sure we help clarify that a bit, give you some pointers, some advice from what we've seen, and hopefully you walk away today with kind of a better perspective of how to eliminate some of these concerns, eliminate some of these questions throughout your project. Real quick show of hands, how many people in here are either starting or in the middle of a implementation, either from a WMS, a labor, or a TMS project. Anybody in here? Okay, thank you for raising your hands. Our marketing team will be seeing you afterwards. Uh, make sure we get your badges scanned. So let, let's talk about what we're, gonna, what we're gonna dive into. So we're gonna define success. Uh, how many show of hands, how many of you have been a part of an unsuccessful project? Jeremy and I can both raise our, well, not really you, but so that, that's what we want to try to avoid. We're going to talk a little bit about expectations of reality. I think this is extremely important. Uh, a lot of times people go into a project and they have these grandiose expectations. Reality is much closer uh, to earth than, than what they think. Setting and achieving your timeline. Timelines are expensive if you miss them. Timelines are extremely important. So we're going to talk about that. And then a little bit of the chicken and egg. Anybody ever have to deal with change management? How do you do that if you don't have the right team? Well, I gotta have the right team to be able to do change management. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that, which one came first, which one's more important, et cetera. So we'll dive into that. So two quick examples I'm gonna have Jeremy share with you of a successful project and an unsuccessful project. Yeah, so I should clarify, this isn't an open sky project, I just wanna be clear about that, right? But what we have seen lately, and there's been more and more of these articles popping up for any of those folks that follow kind of warehousing news, WMS projects specifically can be extremely impactful to your business in a negative way. Um, you know, a lot of folks picture these technology kind of projects, these WMSs, et cetera. That happens behind the curtains, right? That's not customer facing. That happens inside of concrete. There's a bunch of racking. No one's going to see that. That's not necessarily the case. These projects, there's a reason these things are terribly stressful. There's a reason steam was coming out of that gentleman's ears, and it's because this could be the end result. That's why we take these so seriously is because ultimately, you know, projects aren't anymore. This isn't a matter of inconveniencing your warehousing or inconveniencing your, your brick and mortar stores. Warehousing projects now, they're directly influencing your clients, right? This is a client-facing project now. 
with a warehouse management system implementation, and you don't want to you don't want to end up with a scenario where a CEO is sending out a letter telling your customers directly, hey, you need to lower your expectations. We've had an issue with our supply chain. So that's why we want to make sure we take these so seriously and point out what, what potential consequences you could face if this doesn't go well. Now, to that same end, right, these, these projects can prompt incredibly successful results as well. Supply chains are revolutionizing. I don't have to tell you that. You're at Modex. I think we've all figured that out, right? And so supply chains are revolutionizing and they are producing better results for your customers. This isn't a minimally invasive project in the fact that it doesn't just say, okay, well, it'll arrive in a different box or a different size box when it gets to you. We've seen implementations where we're able to ship things same day, next day, two day, where it used to be five days, seven days, two weeks. And so this is something that can be vastly celebrated if done right. And so what we like to emphasize is Implementations don't have to be a horror story, right? Everybody hears, oh no, new system, right? That's scary stuff. We wanna try to take the fear out of that. This is something you can leverage. This should be something you go in with as a weapon, not as a deficiency for your business. We wanna make sure you're armed with something coming out of a WMS implementation, something that's going to make you more successful as an overall company, not simply more successful as a warehouse. So we've talked about success a little bit. I wanna quickly poll you guys anybody who'd like to give an answer. What's your definition of success in a project? Anybody want to share that? As I know some of you have raised your hand, said you're looking at kicking off a project, you're in the you know, discovery phases, whatever it might be. Anybody, has anybody defined what success is going to look like in their project? Anyone? Good thing, we're, good thing you're here then. Uh, so let's talk a little bit more about some of the things that we've seen. Our, oops, sorry our customers list from a, a perspective of when Jeremy and some of our team goes out and sits down with them. Let's talk a little bit about some of those, Jeremy. So my favorite KPIs are not the ones that come up during a go live. <laughs> I, um, I can tell you I've had several go lives and I'm, some of you have guilty faces and so I'm just, I'm zoning in on you. but. My favorite keep KPIs are not the ones where we're two days into a go live and suddenly someone rushes into the war room and says, hey, I, I, just so, just, I, I need to ship 200 cases per hour today. <laughs> I would have appreciated that information months ago. And so would the rest of your business, right? And so it's extremely important to set KPIs early on in a WMS project. And we have to be realistic about those. And so understand that you are converting to a new system. You're changing processes vastly in some scenarios. And the last thing I want to see is some expectation that you're going to double your productivity on day one, right? Now, other folks, they go, okay, we're not going to double our productivity. We're going to take it easy on our warehouse for the first week. And I love that scenario too, because for the first week, everybody's, everybody's wearing smiles, right? We've reduced our inbound trucks by half. We've reduced our outbound vol volume by half, and everybody's just, man, roll out the celebration card, set off the fireworks, do a parade in the parking lot. We are golden. We made it. We did a WMS implementation. Bam, week two, double the volume. Here's the real stuff, and suddenly everybody's, uh, everybody's running in fear, right? And so there's a balancing act that has to occur there, and it's not strictly a balancing act of how you stagger your volume. It's, it's a balancing act in how you prepare your business. Right, And so I always like to make sure that these goals aren't simply internal to the WMS project team. And we'll talk more about teams later, but those goals should be shared with the entire business and, and to some extent your customers as well. And so understanding that, hey, you know, we are implementing a new system. There is going to be a learning curve. We're going to do everything we can to prevent you know, that impacting our customers, but we all need to be prepared that day one, our KPIs are this. Week two, our KPIs are this. Week three, our KPIs are going to go up. But it's about having that clear definition of what is success? What can I look at and celebrate with my team? What can I share with my team and say, this is really where we'd like to be? So that way, everybody's on the same page in both a project team mechanism and an actual user standpoint. And so that's very important from a, from a goal setting standpoint. And I think the other thing Jeremy mentioned, talking about the team, I think one of the key things, and we're going to talk a little bit deeper about team here in a minute, but one of the critical things to think about when you're talking about any type of these transformational platforms is this isn't just an IT project or this isn't just an operational project or this isn't just a software project. This is an entire organization. So 
Um, we're actually working with a client right now that they spent the last two years trying to transform their transportation part of the business. Uh, they got two years in and realized not everybody took this as serious as they did. So all of their transportation planners were spending 80% of their time trying to, trying to get this software platform up and off the ground. IT wasn't heavily invested. Operations, really, it was about 20% of their, their time. They spent two years and a significant amount of capital. It wasn't with us, it was some, with somebody else, but they failed the project. They've actually completely scrapped the project and they're starting over from scratch. Now, the first thing we did when we went in is said, what's your team look like? We went and met with them and the room was full of people and it was mostly their planners and mostly the folks that would touch the system on a day-to-day -day basis. Our first question was, where's your IT representation? Where's your operational? Where's your accounting? Where's your finance? So when we talk about a team, one of the first things we have to do and when we talk about all of these objectives and goals is your team needs to be inclusive of everybody in the organization. If you're just gonna have two guys in a dream in the back of the closet going, hey, we're gonna get this WMS off the ground, you're probably not gonna be very successful. It's important to understand when we think about team, it, you've gotta get out of your silos and you've gotta get out there with the rest of the organization because you've gotta have buy-in from everybody because at some point, finance is gonna get involved, operations is gonna get involved, IT is gonna get involved. It's extremely important that everybody's in the boat rowing the same way and everybody understands the goals and the metrics that you have as you kind of get towards that go by. Yeah, Shannon, one more point before we move away from that. Do me a favor and ask yourselves as a business how you're going to actually get this information day one, right? And so I've had several folks go, well, we had that report in our old system. We had that report in our old system. Where's, where's that report now, right? So your user acceptance testing, your mock go lives, right? All those activities. Be asking those questions then as well. Where am I going to get this information? How am I going to query that from a brand new system with brand new metrics, right? How do I make sure that I'm looking at, I want to compare apples to apples here, right? And new systems don't do a great job. I mean, you're implementing something new, right? So it's not going to be apples to apples unless we make sure of that. We're huge on dashboarding. We absolutely love putting all those dashboards up throughout the building, throughout the screens, right? Enterprise level dashboards, et cetera. And we just need to make sure those are clearly defined, well understood by the entire business. So just don't wait till, don't wait till, you know, go live to figure out how you're going to mine this information. It's very important to get that early on. Questions so far? Anybody? No? All right. We'll keep going. So let's talk a little bit about expectations versus reality. Um, I know some of you raised your hand when you said you've been a part of a failed project or a failed implementation. I would guess that as Jeremy kind of starts to dive into this a little deeper, you would all agree the expectations you had going into that project versus the reality of what happened were vastly different. And one of the biggest things we see here is I kind of made the joke about two guys in a dream in the back of the closet. Uh, we run into that a lot, right? The expectations is, is oh, we're gonna have this big team and everybody's gonna be involved and we're all gonna, we're all gonna take this and then all of a sudden the project kicks off and guess what happens? Oh, I got pulled into this fire. Oh, I gotta, I gotta complete this KPI. Oh, I've got this project. So the reality is, is as you plan for that, Jeremy talked about where you're going to get the data, where you're going to get this. The reality is, is you have to set realistic expectations. You cannot set up and go, oh, I'm going to get everybody's time 100% of the time for the next 24 weeks. That is not a reality. So that's just one quick example that as you think about that, what is your true reality? What is your, your, your finance folks? They're going to need to be involved in the project. I guarantee you they're not giving you 100% for the next 24 weeks. They're gonna give you 10% of their time, 15% of their time if you're lucky. So those types of things, Jeremy, I'll let you go a little bit deeper with that, but. Yeah, so do me a favor, WMS kickoff meeting. Anybody ever attended one of those? We're doing a new WMS, everybody get in a room, we all hold hands, sing kumbaya, right? Fun slides, pretty colors. Everybody does their introductions. The next three questions you should ask are these, right? So number one, what do you have right now? And what I mean by that is, what do you want to keep? What, what are you doing well, right? And so, for example, you could have a warehouse full of already stocked equipment, beautiful racking, et cetera. We like the way that works. We don't want to do robots. We're, we're not changing that, right? Establish what you've done well, what you like about their, your current system. Some of you will say nothing. I guarantee you there's something you like about that thing, right? And so define what you have, define what your business has, what they have that they're proud of what you have that you absolutely need to continue to deliver. Define those things up front so you know exactly what the expectation and 
what the, what the requirement is from the business. Number two, what do you need? What does absolutely need to improve? What can I not live without? WMSs these days, tier one WMSs, all the bells and whistles you could ever dream of. Some of that stuff, you'll never need to use. Uh, some of it, right, you absolutely need. We need to make sure we deliver this capability out of this product. We want labor management now. We want to be able to see real-time information about what users are doing in our warehouse. We definitely want cartonization. We want to stop shipping small things in huge boxes, right? Define what you absolutely want to get out of this project. And then finally, this one's the most important in my opinion, clarify what you're willing to change and what absolutely cannot change. For the last time, I can't replace your host ERP system. I am simply responsible for execution here, right? I can only do so much. If you don't like your three initial host management ERP system that may start with an S and, right? I can't fix that. I can't replace that. My job's the WMS here. And define that for the room, right? We're only capable of interacting with the data that I receive. And so if I'm not getting a carrier from them, I can't suddenly derive a car carrier unless I'm getting more information, right? So make sure the whole room's on the same page in terms of what can and cannot be done in terms of actual change. We're not all going to be dreamers here. We have to be realistic about what you're capable of as an organization overall. One other piece that I'll add to that when you talk about what you're willing to change, and this is the most important piece of your team. Uh, all of you have probably sat in a meeting, whether it was for an execution system, for an, uh, an ERP, for whatever it might have been, a decision that you had to make within your organization, and the decision never got made, and never got made, and never got made, and you just kicked the can down the road for as long as possible. Um, one of our operations folks, we, we always joke about this project, it was kicked off with a, a very large grocer, and basically design typically, Jeremy, a week, two weeks is typically about what a design. Jeremy talked about kind of the kickoff meeting. Everybody's singing, everybody's happy, we're all, we're all doing that. Typically about a week to two weeks of, of design. We were six months in and hadn't even gotten past the design session. One key critical element was missing from their team. They didn't have somebody who could make the final guess. So as you think about when you're constructing your team, you need to have somebody in the room who can stand up and say, I'm saying yes to this change or I'm saying no to this change. You have to have somebody on your team who is willing to take and draw a line in the sand and say, this is it we're making the decision, we're moving forward. Otherwise, you're in this never-ending cycle of opinion, right? It's great to have people involved, you want your team involved, you want people excited about this transformational change you're about to go through, but at some point you have to draw the line and say, okay, now we actually have to make the leap and, and get started. So it's critical to have that piece that is that person who's able to stand up in the room and go, nope, I get everybody's point, I understand it, but this is what's best for the business. This is what we're doing. So you have to have that, that person on your team. Anyone else you want to head there? All right. Setting and achieving your timeline. Anybody in here ever miss a timeline? Alan? <laughs> I just called Alan out because he works with us. But timelines are extremely important. Um, from a sales perspective, Jeremy does operations, does implementations, but also helps with sales. That's one of the key questions we always get. How long is this going to take? That is the, the, the question that every CEO, CFO, COO, CIO, any senior level person that I've ever spoken with in a room, that question is inevitably asked of me. How long is this gonna take? Are you really gonna be able to do this in four months? Can we really do this in six months? My last ER implement ERP implementation is still ongoing and we've been doing it for two years. How long is the timeline? Timelines are extremely critical to the business. And to get to that point, to be able to achieve those timelines and meet those, there's kind of three key things that you have to take into effect. Yeah. So first of all, your site preparedness. Understand where you stand today. If I walk in to do a WMS implementation, you go, yeah, as soon as we get those racks put up, and as soon as we get those locust, locust robots running, and as soon as, we, man, this WMS is going to hum, right? Well, that's going to be quite a moving target for me for you to get those rackings up, put that flow rack in, get your robots running, get your WES hunt plugged in. Right? That's, a, that's a whole lot of coordination that needs to happen. Make sure you've got that preparedness happening in the right order. Right? Don't make it something nebulous, something agnostic that I have to chase. Right? And so make sure you're prepared for that WMS project when it comes. Secondly, and we'll talk more about team later, but I can, you'll hear Shannon and, say, and I say that a lot. Team is absolutely fundamental to this. And then finally, Buckle up, this is going to be the one thing, if nothing else that I'd like you to take away from this, 
the impact of customizations on a system implementation. Customizations, anybody got something customized that they regret in this room? Regrettable customizations? There we go, at least one person bold enough to admit it. Um, customizations, right? If I was to take you back 15 years, um, and we were to look at what projects used to be for WMS, I'd sit down at the front of the table and go, what do you guys want the system to do? What, what are you thinking, right? What do you, what do you want? We'll build that. We'll build it for you. It'll be beautiful. We'll build it for you, and you will never upgrade it, and it will decline as technology moves on, and you will be stuck with that old system. Customizations are incredibly dangerous. Question, question, question every customization. We have a very, very anti-customization rule. It's fun to look at our developers. They used to compete about how, how creative they could be with customizations, right? That was the old days. Now, our developers are competing about how creative they can be with a base product solution. And so how can I repurpose a base product functionality? How can I extend a base product functionality to give you a software that you can still upgrade and support, right? Software used to be like cars. You'd go in, you'd buy your 1995 Ford Taurus, and you were stuck with the functions and features of that 1995 Ford Taurus. Sure enough, that thing had run, but if you brought it back to the Ford dealership and said, hey, could you give me all that new stuff? I really want all those cameras and all this nifty adaptive cruise control. They'd look at you like you're crazy. You can't, you can't do that, right? Software doesn't work that way anymore. You can implement your system today and upgrade, and upgrade again, and upgrade again, and continuously take advantage of those new features. I implemented a few years ago a customer that was doing um, meat packaging, and so they had all kinds of catch weight stuff, man. They had all kinds of catch weight, and it was crazy. You know, I bring product in, yep, that's one case, but it's 3.76 pounds. And sure enough, right after we implemented, the software provider came out with all these new features around catch weight. You could catch fat fingers, you could catch over tolerances, all kinds of stuff. Sure enough, they upgraded and took advantage of it immediately. It wasn't a major project for them. It was, let's regression test, take the upgrade, now we're gonna move forward with those new features. And so, that is a possibility but you have to be careful about how much you customize. I have another client, this one's extremely relevant right now. I have another client that, believe it or not, just great business model. They manufacture sanitary wipes, sanitation products, cold medication, and vitamins. So they are just, they're in the right business, specifically right now, right? And so they have just, they, they've nailed it. And so anyways, they suddenly need a new warehouse, quickly, quickly. They need a new warehouse. They're able to take their existing code base template, put that up, load their locations, and run. There's no customizations they have to trip over. There's no location-specific features they have to trip over because they took a templatized, non-customized approach. I cannot emphasize this enough. Question every customization that's made to a software. Leverage base functionality as much as possible. And dare I say, in some scenarios, you may need to adapt. There's a reason software is built the way it's built, right? This software isn't new. There's not many new tier one WMSs out there. You're not gonna go out there and find this brand new WMS company. Maybe a rebranded one, but a brand new one you're not gonna find, right? They've been doing this for a long time. They know how warehouses work. They've incorporated features that have been requested. There's a reason they work the way you do. If you wanna stand on your head while you pick and the system doesn't support that, it's probably because you shouldn't be standing on your heads while you pick. There's a good reason for that. and Maybe take that into consideration. Understand why it does work the way it does because there's certain impacts to that. And so just be aware of that, approach it with an open mind, and just know there are customization consequences. Minecraft, yeah, that's right. Minecraft used to play that. Don't turn your WMS into a Minecraft game. I don't want to be randomly clicking on cubes and suddenly, bam, there's a mine, right? That's what customizations do to you. And you don't want to get into that cascading, you know, very creepily walking coding mechanism of, of customization. So again, I know I'm emphasizing that a lot, but I just wanna be very, very, very insistent upon that. If you have a software provider walk in, a software partner walk in and say, yeah, I think we can make it do that, you should probably just tap the brakes the, a little. Go ahead in the meeting right then. Just <laughs> go ahead and walk out. Tap that's, the brakes a little and say, is it standard, right? Make sure to ask that. Make sure to ask that during your sales demos. Make sure to ask that during your sales cycle. Is it standard? Can I upgrade? Continue, continue, continue to ask those questions. Questions, anyone? Any questions? No, no questions so far? Okay, let's keep going. Setting and achieving your timeline. I really kind of put this up here, <coughs> excuse me, I put this up here
because we wanted to kind of say this is the opposite of what you should do. So this is a, anybody ever seen this before? Anybody ever worked through this? This is painful. This is hurtful. My operations folks see these and they go, no, we're not doing that. Um, Open Sky is very much a, a, an agile shop. We're very flexible. So one of the things we wanted to put up there, this, this is a timeline killer right here. This, this is what will kill your timeline is, nope, I can't go on to the next phase until I finish this phase right here. I've got to get done with this. One of the things we try to do, so when Jeremy talks about warehouses being spun up in weeks and months versus years, is our ability to iterate throughout the process. So we might be doing POCs of receiving and put away, but we're still doing configuration for replenishment. I want my guys on the floor seeing, hey, this is exactly, you told me this is how you want to receive. I'm going to show you how to receive. We've had times where we've been doing POCs four and five weeks into a project. Hey, this is what you said receiving should look like. This is what it looks like right here in the system. You're only able to do that if you don't customize the heck out of it. So this is kind of the older methodology. This is what people used to follow. This is waterfall. This is what every single ERP implementation in the world does. This is what we don't do. We try to be extremely flexible. We try to be agile. We, we try to work through because how many times have you ever started a project and about halfway through your business model has to change? Something happens within your business that you have to be flexible to adjust to it. You've got to be adaptable. That's what we try to do. So when you think about this, somebody shows you a timeline like this, stand up and say, how can I become more agile? How can I become more flexible? How can we make sure that we're going to deliver on time? Questions, thoughts, Jeremy? Yeah, another spot where you want to emphasize overlap of activities, where you don't want to be a waterfall. Boy, I'm getting all the fun topics today. I talked about customization and now integration. There's not a slide on taxes. I won't be talking about that. That's about what I'm, you know, just all the bad news over here. Integration, big topic. One of the largest, if not the largest risk to timeline is integration in a project, right? WMSs will run great in a vacuum, but unfortunately we have to talk to other systems in there. And I can't tell you how many times we've kicked off a project, we sit down with the operations folks and go, you know, man, if I just had that one piece of data, if I just had that one thing coming from the host system, my job would be so much easier. And we don't get the integration guys involved until another six months down the project. That's not how it should work. We make sure to include integration folks in the design of the software. They may not care about all of that stuff. Actually, I can guarantee you they don't, right? But when those topics do come up, if I could just get a little more information about the customer, if I could just know what channel that customer is, if I could just know that that product is this dimension or, or weight limitation, man, it would make my life easier in the warehouse, right? Just knowing that up front, getting ahead of that, Getting those other systems to co coordinate and, and give you that information you need is huge. And that's where we see that overlap really pay off for companies. So now we get to the meat of it, selecting the right team. This is what everybody's been waiting for. Um, you know, there's a couple of things, and, and I talked earlier about key players. We're going to talk, I'm going to have Jeremy dive in a little bit more about ringers versus the rosters. I'm more of a roster guy. I bring Jeremy in. He's my ringer. So I, it's extremely important. I cannot stress it enough to really focus on the team. Every project that we look at, we, when we sit down with our clients, we sit down and that's one of the first questions we ask them. Who is your team? Who's going to be involved in the project? Who's your decision makers? Who's going to align with our team? We have a project lead. We have operational folks. Who's going to align from your side to be able to make the decisions, et cetera? So when we, as, as Jeremy kind of goes through this, take in mind, this is, in fact, probably the most critical part, Jeremy, correct me if I'm wrong, of, of the entire process. Yeah, so I put ringers versus rosters up here, and what that means is, should you go out and recruit a bunch of people that have done WMS's projects before, right? Should you go out and hire this team of ringers that have just, you know, they're, they're the guys that have, you know, they're the, they're the two million milers on the airplane. They've just, they've done WMS projects their whole life. Is that, is that what you should be going after? or? Or should you look, be looking internally and say, what can I find internal that I already have on my team that can be repurposed for a WMS project? And quite honestly, it's a little bit of both, right? And so I've seen folks make the mistake of going out and getting a bunch of WMS brains. And well, that's great, but they don't know anything about your business. They haven't been around for 20 years. They don't know what you've tried and failed at already, right? Same thing with rosters. Not everybody you have that's working day to day in your operation will be prepared for the type of project work that a WMS entails. But there is a combination there, and more specifically, I guarantee you, in most of your warehouses, there is a supervisor just dying to learn about this stuff. 
some of my greatest IT resources have grown from being a warehouse supervisor to being incorporated on a WMS project team to being promoted throughout that WMS to being the lead support person to innovating that supply chain 10 years down the road. Look for those opportunities. It is a great way to get the young minds in your supply chain involved in a project. And that's really where I go. Look at your roster, see who you have, see who you can associate with your WMS, WLM projects to really grow that talent pool inside your company. You don't always have to look out. Partners, big deal, right? Not every partner is created equal. Your partner could be the software provider itself, right? I go and buy a license for that software, and sure enough, they've got a great team of services folks that come along with the deal. Your partners could be someone that simply partners with that software. They work closely with the software. They have a good relationship. Your partners could be someone that's completely software agnostic. They're just WMS implementers, period. I'm not going to say there's a right or wrong answer to that. You just need to make sure you're all singing the same tune, right? I always like to make sure that your software partners, whether it's the software company yourself, itself or the consulting firm that they don't consider selling a deal, selling a license, that's never success. That's never success to them, right? If they're celebrating a sale, that's a concern. We should always be celebrating the go live. We should always be celebrating the results, right? So just make sure of that. Make sure that's the eye. That's the eye on the prize there is the end result of your project. And then finally, post implementation, I always like to emphasize, I don't think I've ever done a WMS implementation where I haven't looked back at it and said, you know, I think we could have I think we could have done that one piece a little bit better, right? Always understand there's going to be optimization opportunities post implementation. I don't care how many UATs you do, I don't care how many scripts you write, I don't care how many mock go lives you do. There's always going to be something where you pause and go, "Man, now that it's in production, now that I've seen it run for a couple weeks, I really really wish we would have done this one tweak." Right? Leave room for some of those tweaks post implementation. I, I you know, that project timeline that we showed should have an optimization period post implementation. Something where you can look back and go, you know what, we can make that process a little bit better. Leave some time for that, understand that's going to be a part of it, and dedicate team members for that. So just like we've talked about team during implementation, understand you've got engineering resources, et cetera, that can assist post implementation. Critical to have those post go live resources that are there to help you. Because one of the things, especially in labor systems, and Jeremy's gonna talk about labor next, I think, but one of the most important things is labor, along with any other execution system, is kind of a living, breathing thing. It's constantly changing, constantly evolving. If you look at your labor force today and you look at it what it was 12 months ago versus 24 months ago, I think actually two years ago we stood in a room very similar to this, talked about the changing space of labor and what it's gonna look like. If you think about how you hire people today and how you schedule people and how they want to work for you, that has changed dramatically in the last 12 to 14 months. So you need to absolutely have those optimization resources at the ready after you've gone live. You want to consistently be where It's just like buying a car. I don't buy a car and then go drive it 90,000 miles, never change the oil, never change the tires, never change anything, and then come back to the dealer and go, how come the thing broke down? Same thing with your platform. If you don't continually keep it in check and keep it in tune and optimize it to what's going on in your world, you're going to be, you're going to be, you can have the greatest go live in the world, but six months down the road, you're going to be very unhappy. So change management. Actually, we're going to talk about labor next, but change management. Anybody ever told a salesperson, oh, we're very different. We do things unique. I can't tell you how many times I walk into a warehouse that ships pallets and boxes and says, we do it differently. No offense to anybody in here. If I haven't talked to you, actually some of you I have talked to, but let me tell you something. Everybody does the same thing. They get product in the door, they put it away, and they get it out the door. Now, there are different steps inside, and everybody has their own little things that they do, but that is the killer of all deals. Oh, we're special. Oh, if it's not broke, don't fix it. We've always done it this way. Anybody ever said that in a meeting? We've always done it this way? I've actually said that myself. I've had people tell me that so many times in meetings. Jeremy and I have sat in meetings and say, well, that won't work here. Nope, we, we've always done it this way. We've always picked this way. Well, that's great. They used to make cars with cranks on them too, but now you just push a button and it starts for you. So that, that's the one thing that we look at. So change management next to the team is extremely critical. When you look at you know, how that affects people, don't, don't be afraid to ask people questions. Don't be afraid to get people involved. And I think, Jeremy, that, that's probably extremely important to get people involved, correct? Yeah. You know, oftentimes, at least with WMS implementations, WLM implementations, it's not the change that folks are really rejecting or that they're not compliant with. It's the fact that the change was made in a silo. 
this change, the change was made without involvement, you know, the change was made without the information. It was made non-transparently, right? And so a lot of times it's not a matter of saying, oh, well, we can't change because our folks will reject that. It's a matter of saying, why are we changing this? Informing folks. I mean, I can't tell you how many times that I've seen projects fail because supervisors, just floor supervisors, aren't able to explain why we're doing something a certain way now, right? And so, I mean, I've seen scenarios where we used to just load our trucks. We don't scan it, you know, we never scanned it before. Why do we have to scan trucks now? And just clarifying that, hey, last year alone, we found 614 pallets left on the dock throughout the year because we weren't scanning pallets to a trailer. Yes, we know it takes longer to do that step, but we're going to have a much better result to our end client, and we're going to save time in these other three steps. Just providing a simple explanation such as that for a small change goes a long ways in the success of your project. I'm telling you, a lot of your project will hinge on change management. You could build the perfect system. You could build a beautiful WMS, but if you don't give your users the power to wield that WMS correctly, you have failed your entire project. You built a beautiful system that none of your users understand and they don't like. And so it's very, very important to have transparency in why you're making changes and don't hide those to the end. I don't want to be standing in a go live kickoff, you know, hoorah, rah, everybody's got their fluorescent vests on, everybody's signed into their gun for the first time. Oh yeah, and by the way, we changed this, right? Don't do that. Get the information out early. Bring people into the proof of concepts. Go out on the floor. Show them what the new guns will look like, what the new tablets will feel like. Show those screens early, often. Post that information. Have folks informed. Have them involved in that decision-making process. And then I always like to break that into three categories. Those that will hear about the software change, those that will see the software change, and those that will actually use the software that's changing. Don't use the change management approach the same for everybody. Your salespeople don't care what the new screens are going to look like. They'll never see those screens, right? What they are going to do is they're going to hear the results of the WMS. They're going to be talking to their customers, they're going to be talking to their customer service reps, and they're going to hear all about this new system. So have a change management protocol for those folks. The folks that are going to see the software, your, your customer service folks, those guys, the, the transportation guys, the drivers, right? Make sure they know what's changing, and they don't need to know what buttons to click. They'll never click a button, but they're going to see the dashboards. They're going to see the order updates. They're going to see that information. Make sure they have a catered approach. And then finally, obviously, those that are going to use the software, you're going to want to have an immersive process for them to be adapting to that change. One of the other things Jeremy talks about, he talks about how to how to how to communicate this to your team. One of the things Open Sky has started doing, especially with some of our larger clients who are going through more transformational processes, is leveraging our marketing team to work with their team to develop internal marketing. It's critical for those folks. If I'm somebody who's been on the floor for 20 years and I've driven the fork truck and I've always done it this way, and now you're gonna tell me I gotta do it a different way, I'm gonna tell you I know better than you. But if we communicate that message in the right way, and that's one of the things we've seen be extremely successful is working together to create internal marketing. Here's why we're making the change. Here's some of the value. Here's the things we want to do. Because one of the things we find is employees that have been there that long, they actually want to stay. They want to work for you. They like being there. They just want to understand what's going on. So to Jeremy's point, you don't make that decision in the vacuum. We, we include those people. Part of our sales process is we do go out, we spend time on the floor, we understand what people are doing and why they're doing their job. And we leverage that when we come back to communicate later. Hey, remember when you talked about how it was a, it was a big challenge to be able to go all the way across the warehouse to do X, Y, and Z? Leveraging the system, you no longer have to do that. So being able to work that message together, we, we, we bring in some of our marketing folks, we've worked with other marketing teams internally to help create those messages, create cards, create descriptions of what's gonna happen and the value to the company. That goes a long way with your employees, which by the way, are your most vital resource. Speaking of that, let's talk a little bit about labor. So, and, and yeah, and I, you know, this one's not just labor specific. Something that, I'll, I'll be honest, if I'd presented this five years ago, I'd never put this slide in there. But in today's world, we're seeing logistics employees have a strong voice in terms of satisfaction with how a system works and how easy it's making their jobs. And so, I don't know about you, but I've read a lot of articles lately around, you know, dissatisfaction of warehouse employees, dissatisfaction, misunderstandings of how a system works and how much it's making you walk, how a labor standard's holding you accountable. I'm not able to take restroom breaks. I'm not able to do this. I'm not able to do that, 
right? And that's an article you would have never seen 10, 15 years ago. Logistics employees have a voice. We're going from brick and mortar to concrete and racking, and suddenly, you know, it's, it's changing the way that warehouses are perceived, the way that systems are perceived in a warehouse. Something to keep in mind when doing a WMS implementation is going to be the consideration of how easy it makes an employee's job, how, how, how consumable that system is, right? And, you know, things as simple as extra key punches, as additional travel, as misinformation, it's very, very important to get out in front of that. The last thing you want, and something that, again, we didn't perceive as really a risk back in the day, something you don't want is your company's name in a news article that says labor standards are impossible to hit, right? I'm being pushed to my brink. I'm being traveling too much. It's, and again, this isn't something that's been really a challenge until lately. Understand that going into a project. Keep that in mind. It goes back to that change management, but it also goes into employee onboarding. It goes into the way you design the system itself. Give users something that, that is user-friendly. Give them something that makes sense to them. Give them something that can be perceived well. It's a tool to help you do your job, right? That's what it should be. I, I don't want to take orders from a WMS. I want the WMS to help me and assist me in accomplishing my job. And so keep that in mind throughout an implementation. Again, this is something new for us. This is something we're just discovering, but provide information. I mean, when's the last time most of our new warehouse employees, when's the last time they had to balance a checkbook? We don't balance checkbooks anymore. We look online, add an app to see what our balance is. Same thing with a labor standard. I don't want to have to go mine into a bunch of information. I want to have paper reports, hey boss, what was, Give them visibility to labor management standards. Give them visibility to their score for the day. Give them visibility to how much work is left in the day. They, you know, informing your employees, keeping them informed, keeping them aware of what's going on in the system, how they're doing, how well they're doing, is an extremely important factor into the systems that we're implementing, implementing today. One of the things Jeremy keeps talking about is in, informing your employee, giving them examples of stuff that's going on, keeping them retention. Anybody in here face retention problems in their warehouse? Yeah, there's all of you could probably raise your hand. That is the number one thing that a lot of our clients deal with is how do I get employees, but how do I keep them? And Jeremy was talking earlier, we'd give a lot of talks on labor. Uh, Jeremy's probably done hundreds of labor implementations over his lifetime. Uh, he looks really young, but he's older than he is, uh, <laughs> older than that. But one of the biggest things that we have found, and there was a report that came out, I think it was about a year and a half ago, that the number one reason people look to leave their job, especially in the warehouse, was because they were, never, they were never recognized or they didn't get any feedback from their boss. It wasn't dollars, wasn't the hours, wasn't flexibility. It was, I didn't get any feedback. Nobody told me whether I was doing good or bad. That is the key when you're looking at these systems. Again, most people, when we start talking about labor systems, everybody goes, okay, who, who am I going to get to fire? How do I trim that 20%? A, labor, a true labor system is really about right-sizing your employee workforce. It's understanding who are your A players, how to keep them A players, understanding who are your Bs and coaching them up to As, and who are your Cs. Are they worth are they worth investing in? Are they worth worth communicating with and trying to raise them to a B player? Because people are tough to find right now. And that is a critical piece of this. If you start to share this information, people start to be able to see their their performance. They start to see where they rank. They start to understand, hey, we're going to invest in you. People will stick around and they won't go down the street to go work at Amazon for twenty five cents an hour or more. And that is something we have seen dramatically shift within the warehouse and, and the labor forces that we work with. Takeaways. So everybody ready to go out and tackle a WMS or labor project? You guys all ready? I'll expect you all in our booth later to, to buy. Uh, <laughs> hopefully you understand, hopefully you've been able to take a little bit away of how do you define success? What does it look like for your organization? And there's a number of you in here from different organizations. It will look different for everybody. Some of you are gonna look at this and go, Success for my organization means I'm able to get this platform up and running in the next nine months. I don't care if I've cut 20 people. I don't care if I have to hire. To, I'm able to get the platform up and running, and I provide value to my customer. Some of you will define success different ways. Selecting the right team members. Hopefully, you've probably heard Jeremy and I say the word team 150 times today. Hopefully, you understand selecting the right team is absolutely critical. Uh, one of the things that we do internally at OpenSky is we put together our team when we're talking to a client, when we're talking to a prospect. We don't just go out and we throw somebody out there and say, hey, go try to sell them software. 
we align people from our sales organization, from our marketing organization, from our operations teams. I bring in guys like Alan, who's sitting up here, who works with us, who has a, has a deep history in the pharma business. So when we start talking to pharmacy or medical or healthcare clients, we bring him in because he understands at least a little bit about their business. He's been around it for a long, a long time. He understands when they start talking about how important certain things are, he understands that piece of the business. So even when, when we kind of like to say it this way, we eat our own dog food, we create our own internal team. We understand that just because I'm a salesperson doesn't mean I know everything and do it all. I am all about the team. I played baseball for many, many years. If you don't have a good team around you, you are not gonna be successful. And then handling change. I think that's probably the most critical piece of it. There are multiple ways to handle change, but the most critical piece of that is communication. Communicate, communicate, communicate. It's one of the things we try to do. We have, when, when we're involved in, a, in, a, in, a, in with a project with a client, we, we get to the point where we're almost over communicating. There is no way at the end of this, when Jeremy talks about, hey, we sit down and we're getting ready for a kickoff, very rarely do we have those big fires that jump up. If, if you've ever been a part of a go live and you know, all of a sudden there's 50,000 things going wrong, very rarely during our go lives do we have those. There's a lot of times where our go live support is sent home early because we've over communicated throughout the process. We understand what the client's trying to do. We understand what your needs are, what your requirements are. And, and our goal is to meet those. Jeremy, anything else you want to add? Well, that was close. The red light's flashing at me up here. All right, I'm going to put our information up here. Otherwise, Darcy's going to kill me. So you can feel free to stop by and visit us at booth 7370. Um, you take a picture of this. If you have questions, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, happy to answer or help however we can, even if you're not looking at a platform that we would support. Our guys, we're all about information, all about sharing. It's all about the ecosystem. I have plenty of people that we've helped that went down the path and made a decision with somebody else. Any final questions? Anybody? All right, thank you guys. Appreciate it.